Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Uh, biology lecture on diffusion and osmosis. Okay, so we're going to talk about these two general pro processes and a few others like active transport and phagocytosis and things like that. But what this section is really about is how does well, how do cells regulate what comes in the cell cytoplasm and what leaves the cytoplasm? So what moves in and out of cells? How is it regulated? What's the processes that dictate what can move in and what can't? Okay. And that's kind of what this section is about. Okay. So it's more like molecule movement versus before what we were talking about is cellular movement. All right, so let's talk about diffusion first. Okay? So diffusion is the process of moving materials such as water and nutrients okay, into a cell and things like waste out of the cell. Now, that's not to say that other things like water and nutrients don't move out of the cell, but really the purpose is, is to do this. Okay? So it's kind of like us, you know, consuming things okay, and then removing waste out of the body. Okay? But diffusion is at the cellular level. So how does water move into the cell and waste move out or nutrients in and nutrient waste out? Okay? And this is um, essential for life to evolve, life to survive. Um, and some of the processes are really simplistic, but yet hugely important. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there are three main ways at which things can move across plasma membranes, across biological membranes. The first is diffusion, and that's moving from a high concentration gradient to a low concentration gradient. Okay. The second way is by what we call membrane folding or phagocytosis, so consuming stuff. Okay, So there are two forms of that. Um, one which we call endocytosis, which means you bring in something from the outside. And then the other exocytosis, which means you, you take something from the inside of the cell and release it like a waste product. Okay? And the final one is through transport proteins. Okay? Now that's not to say that diffusion and membrane folding don't utilize membrane proteins. Okay? They do. Okay? But there is a special way at which transport proteins um, come into play. Okay? And that original photo, or the original slide, which is right here, is showing you this. Okay? This is um, showing you how you get uh, things like potassium to move across Okay. and how you might get chloride ions to move into the cell. Okay. You're going to have to utilize energy to drive this system okay. in some cases. In other cases, if it's a high concentration, like it's shown here, high concentration of potassium, it'll move across through a protein channel, or a high concentration of chloride will move across through a protein channel. Okay. We'll come back to these because sometimes it's moving against the concentration. Sometimes we want to move potassium into here, then you need to supply energy. Okay, so molecules in general are moving and they're moving constantly. Okay, so even in a solid state, okay, so even in you know a solid piece of paper like this, you still have molecules that are moving in here. Okay? Now I know that it's hard for people to, to grasp that concept that they're moving. It's much easier for people to say, oh, well, you have water, okay? and there's molecules of water that move in here regardless of you know, whether or not I'm spinning it or what I'm doing with it. Okay? There are definitely water molecules moving in liquid water. There are also cellulose molecules moving in paper. Okay? So, but molecules typically move in kind of a random fashion. Okay? And they bounce off other molecules and things like that. And they always have a tendency to produce a fairly uniform mixture. 
Now, diffusion, like I said before, is moving from a, con a high concentration to a low concentration of a said molecule. Okay? So if we're talking about you know, water moving from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water, or salt, or potassium, or glucose, or there's lots of sucrose, there's lots of molecules that'll move from high concentration to low concentration. Right? And that's called diffusion. And when molecules move from a high concentration to a low concentration, we call we say that they're diffusing down the concentration gradient. Right? And the end result typically is equilibrium. Right? So if I took you know this water bottle and I opened it up and I poured some sodium in there, sodium chloride. So I pour some table salt in there. Okay? Give it a little shake. Okay? That'll help with the diffusion process, but I don't have to. And I leave, leave it sit there. Eventually, those molecules of salt will become spread out, diffuse, okay? into regions where there's less concentration. Okay? So the, the glob blob of salt will land on the bottom. Most of you have done this before. It'll land on the bottom and eventually it would dissipate out and you know no matter where you sampled the water, if I sampled from the top or the bottom, eventually it would be at equilibrium. Each piece would be salty and at the same degree of salinity. That's diffusion. Molecules dissolved in a solution are in constant random motion due to their kinetic energy. One result of this motion is that dissolved molecules become evenly distributed throughout the solution. This tendency of molecules to spread out is an example of diffusion. But how do these molecules come to be evenly distributed? Let's start with a beaker of plain water. What will happen if we now add a lump of sugar to the water? A lump of sugar is composed of many individual sugar molecules, and even as a solid lump, the individual sugar molecules are in motion. When the lump is dropped into the water, it begins to dissolve. Individual sugar molecules move randomly and constantly from the area where they are common to the area where they are scarce. This type of motion, when molecules move from areas of their higher concentration to areas of their lower concentration, is called diffusion. Diffusion continues until all the sugar molecules become evenly dispersed throughout the beaker. The rate of diffusion is affected by temperature, size of molecules, and the steepness of the concentration gradient. Although not specifically shown in this animation, this is one of the processes whereby materials are exchanged between a cell and its environment. Okay, so the other thing that I want to add to kind of this, this diagram or this, this video is that, you know, it's showing you that these molecules over here are just bouncing slowly back and forth and they stay in the same spot. Okay, now, that's not true. This molecule might bounce here, and then it might bounce over here, and it might end up down here, and then end up over here, and things like that. They are mixing at equilibrium, but that doesn't mean that they're staying in the exact same spot within in the beaker. Okay, And so these sugar molecules or these sucrose molecules would be bouncing all over the place. You know, relatively slow, but at equilibrium, once they're spread out, you wouldn't know the difference between sugar concentration here or sugar concentration over here. Okay, so <clears throat> now the reason why we bring up just general diffusion is a lot of times that's how things make it into our cells. Okay? Our cells are what we would consider have selective permeability or often we call them a semi-permeable membrane, okay? which means that what enters the cell and exits the cell is controlled. Okay? And it's controlled by the um, cell membrane, mainly the fatty acid tails. And the fact that the fatty acid tails are nonpolar, it stops polar molecules from entering the cell and exiting the cell 
at will. So this selective permeability really has to do with the membrane and how a phospholipid membrane is constructed. Okay. So sometimes though when you want something that has a charge or when you want something that is a polar molecule to move across the membrane you have to utilize transmembrane proteins, proteins that go all the way through the phospholipid bilayer. Okay. <clears throat> Some of these proteins are what we call passive proteins where material can just diffuse across and some of these are called active proteins or have active transport where energy is utilized to drive things across the membrane. <clears throat> For the most part, if it's going down a concentration gradient, it's a passive membrane. And if it's going against the concentration gradient, sometimes called up the concentration gradient, okay, it's an active transport. Now, it's not always the case. Sometimes really big molecules will have to be actively transported across the membrane. Okay? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about these much later um, in lecture. Okay. Now, so that facilitated diffusion, so remember diffusion is movement of high, from high concentration to low concentration or down the concentration rate. A lot of molecules have to have facilitated diffusion where they're using membrane-bound proteins okay, to move through the system. Okay. One that is you know, uh, hugely important is water. Remember, water is a polar molecule, and it can't move across the membrane readily. So it has to move through a protein, okay, and that protein we call them aquaporons, Okay, and so it moves through the protein in the cell and out of the cell. <clears throat> so carrier proteins are these proteins that carry molecules or I shouldn't say carry. They open pores or open the channel, the membrane channel, so a molecule, molecule can move through. Okay? Often they are very specific to a given molecule. So it's working just like an enzyme. So there's an active site. When the molecule enters the active site, it gets pushed through the membrane. You know, often they're they're both directions. So sometimes, you know, sometimes substances are coming from outside the cell into the um, cytoplasm. Sometimes it's moving from the cytoplasm out. Okay, and a lot of those transmembrane proteins or the carrier proteins are both directions, okay? and so they can push material uh, one way or the other. In the process known as facilitated diffusion, a special carrier protein with a central channel acts as a selective corridor which helps molecules move across the membrane. These special carrier molecules that form the protein channel bind only to a specific molecule, such as a particular sugar or amino acid. Once the molecule binds to the carrier protein, this protein helps or facilitates the diffusion process by changing shape and moving the molecule down its concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell where it is released. Facilitated diffusion is similar to simple diffusion in that both involve movement of molecules down their concentration gradient and this movement is carried out without any input of energy. However, in facilitated diffusion, the movement of molecules will only take place if it is facilitated or helped by a special protein carrier in the membrane. Facilitated diffusion can occur in either direction depending on the concentration gradient. If there is a higher concentration of the particular molecule inside the cell, the same carrier protein would then transport the molecules out of the cell. Okay, so just remember if it's facilitated diffusion, okay, it's passive still. There's no energy being supplied. And it's moving down the concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. Okay, so that brings us to osmosis, which is kind of a special form of diffusion. Okay? Now again, like I said before, uh, the membranes, the plasma membranes of cells, 
only allow certain things to come across. Okay? And so those are only things that won't react negatively with the nonpolar lipids. Okay? But things that are polar, things that have charges, okay, they often can't move across that membrane. And so the movement of water okay, is down a concentration gradient is what's referred to as osmosis because os because water is vital to the to living organisms and is polar. Okay, it can move across membranes through aquaporons. We already kind of discussed that, which is just a, a very selective channel for water. The other thing that water does that's a little bit different than, say, just general diffusion okay, is water is going to move down the concentration gradient, but water can move completely down the concentration gradient. So you can have um, completion. So it's not, sometimes um, the system is not going to go to equilibrium, but it might go all the way in one direction. And we'll look at some examples of this in a second when we start looking at blood cells. Right. Now, the, the movement of water really depends on what's the substances in solution. So what's it moving against? So again, let's say we have a membrane in between these two containers. I have water in this one, and I have salt over here. Okay. That membrane is permeable to water. The water is going to move from this container into this container. Right? until the two are equal. But if this is pure water and there's no salt, right, it'll move completely over there and there will not be any water in this container, depending on how much salt there is over here. But it could be possible that there's no water left in this container. It's completely all over here because there's no salt here. Okay? That's osmosis. It's, it's movement of water from high concentrations to low concentrations. Okay. And so as the amount of solute or the amount of substance, in this case, as salt gets diluted or dissolves in solution, there could be a point where um, water stops moving across. Free water molecules stop moving across because it's been diluted enough that it's not detectable a difference in the salt concentration between the two. Okay. And so <clears throat> we can look at this another example. Okay, so you have two solutions, unequal osmotic concentrations. Okay. If the solution has a high concentration of solutes, okay, it's going to be considered hypertonic. If it has a low concentration of solutes, it's going to be considered hypotonic. If it has equal concentration, or it's near equal equilibrium, it's going to be considered isotonic. So here you can see an isotonic solution. We just have water. There's a membrane. This membrane is permeable to water. So water can move across, and water would be moving across. It's not showing it here in the diagram. But water would be moving back and forth even when water is just sitting in there. Okay? To one side of the membrane, if we add something like urea, we could add salt, we could add really anything that changes the substrate amount. Water then on this side is considered hypotonic, meaning that there's less solutes than this side. And this side is considered hypertonic, more solutes on this side. So water is going to move from the hypotonic side to the hypertonic side until it reaches isotonic situation or equilibrium. Okay. Another way to look at this, we can look at it from blood cells. Okay. So remember, you need to concentrate on what the description is talking about. Is the solution in this case, the solution is hypertonic, and you have normal red blood cells, okay, or normal plant cells. So if you drop normal red blood cells, 
or normal plant cells in a hypertonic solution, a solution with more solutes, water will move out of the cell and the cell would shrivel okay, in both cases. If you drop it in an isotonic solution where the solutes are equal to the cell, okay, nothing's going to change. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that water won't be moving. It will. It'll be moving in both directions. So. And then if you drop it in a hypotonic, meaning that there's less solutes in the solution than there are in the cells, okay, water will influx. It'll come into the cell. Okay? And in many cases, it'll flow in so much that it causes the cell to burst. Okay? So we can look at this in a video. The image on the left is human erythrocytes, or red blood cells. The image on the right is enhanced with filters. These living cells are in isotonic solution. Note the lozenge shape. Now the solution has been changed to have a high salt concentration. It is hypertonic. The red blood cells shrivel and become crenated. Finally, the solution has been changed to plain water. The cells swell and burst, leaving empty membranes behind. This phenomenon is called hemolysis. Okay, so again, these red blood cells are being dropped into different solutions. The same can be said when we're talking about what is the cytoplasm of a cell made of. So if the cytoplasm is hypotonic, okay, meaning that it has less solutes in the cytoplasm than there is on the outside, you would expect water to leave the cytoplasm. If the cytoplasm is hypertonic, has more solutes inside than the outside, you'd expect water to flow in. All right, so sometimes it's not just enough to move water and, and you know, simple things, but sometimes you want to move whole organisms in, case, in some cases or whole chunks of material into the cell and out of the cell. Okay? So bulk passage comes in kind of two forms. Okay? A bulk, bulk passage in comes in the form which we call endocytosis, okay? meaning um, things are brought in, engulfed, and brought into the cell, or exocytosis. Things that are inside the cell are dispelled out, or discharged out of the cell. Okay. Now there are two forms of endocytosis, and I guess technically you could say that these are also two forms of exocytosis, but they're normally not used um, in that manner. But two forms of endocytosis. First, you can have phagocytosis, which I've talked about quite a few quite a few times in the class, and that is the engulfing of solid particles, solid matter, or pinocytosis, where you're talking about the engulfing of liquid matter. Okay. Exocytosis, here's a diagram of that. Okay, So you have some kind of material that is not needed in the cell or is waste product or something along those lines. Okay, it forms a unison with the membrane, and then the material is spit out of the cell. Here you can see an electrograph showing that demonstration. Okay. All right, so those are all uh, somewhat passive forms of bringing things into the system. Now we're going to talk about active transport. Active transport is where you utilize those proteins in the membrane but in order to utilize them, you have to supply energy. Okay. Energy, or ATP, which is the currency of the cell, is utilized normally to pump things against the concentration gradient, or up the concentration gradient. Okay. Now again, like I said before, sometimes large molecules can be brought in through active transport. But for the most part, this is to pump things against a concentration gradient. So pump it um, in reverse of which which way diffusion would want to go. Okay. One of the most and probably the most uh, often talked about is the sodium-potassium pump. Okay. And so the 
channel at which we, you know, are utilizing in order for our nerves to fire, okay? And how that works, okay? So again, sodium is going to be pumped into this, or pumped, sorry, out of the cell, and we're pumping three molecules of sodium for every two molecules of potassium, okay? And you're burning uh, one molecule of ATP typically, okay? So you're burning one molecule of ATP to drive three molecules of sodium out of the cell and two molecules of potassium into the cell. Okay. Just by doing that and a few other active transports, okay, we burn about one-third of the 2,000 calories that we're supposed to take in as energy. About one-third of that is to drive these different types of pumps. The sodium-potassium pump is an active transport mechanism that is driven by the breakdown of ATP and works through a series of conformational changes in a transmembrane protein. Three sodium ions bind to the cytoplasmic side of the protein, causing the protein to change its conformation. In its new conformation, the molecule becomes phosphorylated at the expense of a molecule of ATP. The phosphorylation induces a second conformational change that translocates the three sodium ions across the membrane. In this new conformation, the protein has a low affinity for sodium ions and the three bound sodium ions dissociate from the protein and diffuse into the extracellular fluid. The new conformation has a high affinity for potassium ions, two of which bind to the extracellular side of the protein. The bound phosphate now dissociates and the protein reverts to its original conformation, exposing the two potassium ions to the cytoplasm on the inside of the cell. This conformation has a low affinity for potassium ions, so the two bound potassium ions dissociate from the protein and diffuse into the interior of the cell. Okay, so you can see there that there's more sodium on the outside than inside, okay? And in order to get even more sodium out there, you have to use ATP. Same thing with potassium. Okay? So now we're going to progress, and we're going to talk about ATP. We're going to talk about adenosine triphosphate. How is it formed? Okay? What does it mean to be the currency of the cell or the energy currency of the cell? And, um, and then we'll progress into photosynthesis and cellular respiration. All right, till next time.